This explanation of how mythology disproves Noah's Flood is the eighth and final video of this series, although other episodes had been requested. However, not everyone understood why I made this series. On each of the previous episodes, there have been comments to the effect that we don't have to keep beating this dead horse, that everyone already knows that the global flood never really happened. Yeah, everyone already knows that. Everyone except anyone in the current presidential administration. Not even the Secretary of Education knows as much as everyone should. So everyone already knows that Noah's Ark is just a myth, right? Everyone except for the vast majority of senators and state representatives, two-thirds of our state governors, and more than 90% of the legislators in my state, where most of our Board of Education would like for our history books to say that Africa was populated by the descendants of Noah's son, Ham. So yeah, everyone knows that this is just a myth. Everyone except for practically everyone. Most of our government officials at every level in any state are young earth creationists, as are many of our teachers and many of their students. As we've already seen earlier in this series, everything about this fable is an impossible absurdity, yet somewhere between one-third and one-half of our adult population still believes that a 600-year-old man and three untrained laborers with no possible prior experience using only Stone Age tools with none of the equipment or transportation infrastructure necessary for a building that big somehow constructed a structurally impossibly large barge exceeding the skill level of modern shipwrights and even exceeding the limits of physics that could be applied to such a vessel, which we can prove would have torn apart and sunk almost as soon as it got wet. Even if it had been built by experts with all the advantages of modern technology, there's still no possible way that a wooden ark of these dimensions would ever have been seaworthy once loaded with all the implied cargo and necessary provisions, not even in the calmest seas, which believers in this story say would have been tumultuous, challenging even the most worthy craft ever constructed of any material at any size. So you think everyone knows better than to believe in the global flood of Noah's Ark? Conduct a poll somewhere, anywhere in this country. I bet you'll be disappointed to find out how many college students still believe in this fairy tale that you'd think any child should have seen through before they ever got to high school. Such is not the culture in America anymore. We've lost the edge that gave us the greatest technological advances and highest standard of living in history once upon a time. Such that we don't even know what we had and are now ready to surrender everything that made America great and let China take over as the new leader in science and technology. Our Vice President, Mike Pence, wants to make our situation even worse, and so, apparently, does Netflix. America has become a land of fools, easily duped by the least competent con men, where Answers in Genesis made tens of millions of dollars a year on their creation museum, enough to spend another hundred million dollars on an even worse museum celebrating willful ignorance in defense of delusion. Except that it wasn't their money. It was lands and funds given them by private donors and by the state. Then there's the Institute for Creation Research, the so-called Discovery Institute, and the Biblical Science Institute. Yeah, they want you to take that seriously. They're all promoting intelligent design creationism alongside a host of other similar organizations, accepting millions of dollars a year in donations from everyone who I'm told are supposed to know that this is all just a myth. And here I am doing whatever I can against all of that, using only what you're able to donate on Patreon. We may be outnumbered and outfinanced, but we are not outgunned, because all the facts were always on our side, and that still matters to the few rational people we have left in this country, though they're no longer in charge of anything. The absolute best that believers have on their side, really the only thing they have, is that a lot of people have made up stories just like this one. Every culture on every continent has their own collection of unique nonsense regarding catastrophes wrought by gods or giants or other entities, such that there are many different myths about floods. I'm going back to my roots on this one. I started my activism and education advocacy back in the days of Usenet on newsgroups like Talk.Origins, where they have a list of many different flood myths told around the world. Most primitive peoples have been tormented by floods. Those are always dramatic events, so of course everyone has legends about that. But creationists say that means that everyone is telling or remembering the same story, and that's clearly not the case. 
For example, in Tanzania, they say that the water that is now in the oceans used to belong to one couple who stored it all in a small pot and used that to fill their cups. But a little girl accidentally knocked it over and broke it, spilling out enough water to drown the whole world. In the Congo, they tell a similar story, except then it was an old woman who hoarded all the water until a man came and stole it, accidentally washing everything away in the torrent, including himself. In Kenya, they say that a family of spirits caused a flood with a lake full of beer. A Celtic legend has a flood killing all of humanity except for one couple who were saved in a ship built by a titan. But that was a flood of blood from a giant who was also the sky. He laid down too low, too close to the earth, and the sons of the earth killed the giants of the sky. There are a few of these stories where the flood is attributed to giants or elementals rather than gods. Or it might be movements of the world turtle or a lover's spat in the romantic relationship between the sun and the moon, as if they and the stars had passions and personalities, because all these were written by primitive people who didn't know any better. There's a Turkish tale that Alexander the Great caused the flooding of the Mediterranean Sea by digging a canal all the way from the Black Sea, kind of like how American folklore said that Pecos Bill dug the Rio Grande by himself. And sometimes these flood myths are about the formation of this world rather than the destruction of the former one. For example, there's a Transylvanian legend that says that men once lived forever in a paradise with rivers of milk and wine where meat grew on trees. But then someone broke a promise and that caused the rains to come and destroy that world. Several of these floods are said to be caused by broken promises. In Siberia, they say there was a seven-day flood early in human history and that people saved themselves by clinging to floating logs and such, which drifted in different directions, which is why people are dispersed all over the world now. A Scandinavian legend has an ice giant and his family surviving the flood by floating in a hollowed tree trunk. Their descendants begat the race of ogres. Several of these flood myths attempt to explain why there are seashells in uplifted tectonic strata. Some of these flood legends are meant to explain why there are bones of huge and strange beasts buried in the ground, which is why a Siberian tale describes the woolly mammoth as the prince of animals who arrogantly thought they were too big to drown. Other flood stories were devised to explain why we can still see the ruins of buildings underwater in some places. Gods and fairy folk were an easy excuse back when nobody knew about rising sea levels after the end of the last ice age. And sometimes these magical vandals give a warning. In Cameroon, a brother and sister had to marry each other after a flash flood killed everyone else. These two children only survived because a talking goat warned them that the flood was coming and that they better flee while they could. On the Ivory Coast, a celestial god in disguise told one charitable man who was kind to animals to leave the area because the gods were about to send a flood to drown all the cruel people around him. In one of the Roman flood myths, Zeus and Mercury stood on a hilltop and flooded a whole community except for one house belonging to one of their friends. A Zoroastrian version says that the earth had to be expanded in size a couple of times to accommodate the growing population of people, but when the imaginary boundaries of the earth couldn't be extended anymore, the god Ahura Mazda sent a flood as population control. And some of the floods described were apparently based on real events according to the accounts of survivors although all of them were exaggerated with folklorish embellishments added over time. In many of them, people survived by clinging to trees or floating debris or hiding out on high mountains. Otherwise, they survived by hiding inside a gourd or a seashell or a nutshell. The Greeks say a titan survived by floating in a chest for nine days. The same tale is told in Rome also, so it must be true, right? Sometimes it's a boat or a raft. An Indonesian story says that a pregnant woman survived by using a pig's trough as a boat, which she rode with a soup ladle. Then she bore a son, whom she had to marry once he grew up because they were the only people left on Earth. Every story where the whole world floods such that only one couple survives has to endorse incest, and that awkward topic ought to keep most kids from asking embarrassing questions, especially if they're sitting next to their siblings when the story is told. But anyone who does question has to wonder what happened to the animals since they would have drowned too. In a legend from the Ural Mountains, a few people and giants survived in different boats. Then when they saw that the animals had all drowned, they prayed to their god who created the animals all over again, just like Yahweh could have done, easier than getting all the animals in the world into one boat. 
There's a Persian legend opposite that, wherein the world before the flood was full of noxious beasts created by the evil Araman, the earliest version of the devilish Satan. Thus, one of the stars, who also happened to be a rain god, brought on three successive rainstorms lasting ten days each to rid the world of these malevolent monsters. Maybe this is another attempt to explain fossils. Of course, the most obvious and convenient plot device is that someone had a boat. Sometimes it's even a ship that someone had either already built or that the gods provided. Because if the gods can create planets and animals and everything else, they ought to be able to come up with something as simple as a boat. But for some reason, the Jewish God can make everything that people can't make, but he can't make anything people can make. So we have to do all his work, building the ark and the tabernacle and following precise instructions on how to dress his priests in fine garments decorated with precious materials, just like it would be if God were only imaginary. And most of these tales have no connection to Noah's Ark or the Jewish God, but some of them are recent enough and near enough to have borrowed from Semitic tradition. And sometimes there's even a story about how the devil snuck aboard Noah's Ark to survive the flood. And the bit about sending out two or more birds is common too. The first is usually interpreted to be a dove, but the second bird may be a raven, a hawk, or a vulture, although the order can change. And my favorite of all of these legends is from China wherein a defeated warrior climbs up a mountain tall enough that he can reach the firmament. Then, in an attempted murder-suicide, he tears a hole in the sky with his spear, and this causes all the water above the firmament to flood onto the earth below. Then the Naga goddess, Nu Kwa, had to patch the hole in the sky and dry up the flood. As you can see, Nu Kwa is also a creatrix who fashioned the first people out of clay, just like in some other ancient myths. I like this story not for how it differs from Noah's Flood, but for how it's similar. Because throughout the Middle East to the Orient, it was a common belief that the Earth was a flat disk, divided into four quadrants and covered by a giant crystal dome called a firmament. And whether it was on the back of a turtle, as in India, or fixed upon pillars, as in Persia, either way it was like a snow globe in an eternal abyss, where there was water above the firmament, but the sun, moon, and stars were all contained within that expanse. They also thought that the sun and the moon were the same size and that they were both lights and that they were both bigger than all the stars and planets that meandered about in the expanse of that dome, which they called the heavens. Windows in the firmament would allow rain in and fountains beneath the earth would either let water in that way too or pump it back out again or drain it back out again. And such was the mechanism of the flood in most versions of the global deluge all across Asia. And we know for certain that the earth is not flat. Yes, we actually do know that, for certain. We know there is no firmament and that there is no water above where the firmament isn't, because outer space is not full of water. Everything the Bible says about the nature of the earth in relation to the rest of the cosmos is wrong, indefensibly, laughably wrong, and has been known to be wrong for thousands of years. So those who still read these fables literally today are without excuse. Yet that is how it is still described, according to the obviously not so infallible word of ignorant primitives pretending to speak for their God. Now, there doesn't have to be a word of truth to any of the world's many different flood fables, but there might be a bit of truth for a closely connected collection of them. One of the most exciting archaeological discoveries of the 19th century was when a specialist in ancient languages at the British Museum deciphered Iraqi tablets and discovered a parallel account of the Great Flood, but a pagan version that was at least 1,400 years older than the version in Genesis. This flood account was included in the 11th tablet of the Epic of Gilgamesh. The name of the flood survivor and the captain of the ark wasn't Noah, it was Utnapishtim. In time, other tablets were discovered from neighboring regions, telling strikingly similar stories across Mesopotamia, so that the man known as Utnapishtim in Babylon was called Hisuthras in Chaldea, Atrahasis in Akkad, and Zeusudra in Sumer, where the oldest fragments of the story were found. The differences in these are slight. Hisuthras, the Chaldean Noah, was taken directly to the dwelling place of the gods immediately after his ship had landed. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, Utnapishtim, the Babylonian Noah, was rewarded with immortality like the gods, whereas the Jewish Noah didn't get nothing and became a naked old drunk cursing his own kids. 
In each of the pre-biblical versions, the flood was brought about by a pantheon of gods who were tired of the noise that men make. And one of the gods who created humans and was thus sympathetic to their plight secretly revealed the plot to warn the king of Shurapak. In the account attributed to Barossus, the god Cronus warns Hesuthrus that the gods conspired to destroy mankind with a flood and that he had better build a boat in time to save his family. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the god E warns Utnapishtim, speaking to him discreetly from the other side of a reed wall, pretending to speak to the wall itself so that no one would see the meeting. This scene is repeated in the Epic of Atrahasis, where the warning comes from the god Enki. The Epic of Gilgamesh describes something like an earthquake at the start of the flood. The Epic of Atrahasis seems to describe an unusually fierce storm, possibly a hurricane. Then one of the gods complained that the bodies of drowned people clogged the riverways. And these are deeper details that were left out in the later version of Genesis. There are a couple other differences too. Hesuthra's Ark was supposed to be five stades long and two wide, while Gilgamesh's Ark was of equal dimensions, its width as great as its length. But these are still obviously the same story and written by the great grandfathers of the biblical authors. At this point, I'd like to refer to Robert Best. I spoke with him once when his book came out in 1999. He's actually the guy who shattered the last of my supernatural beliefs and let me know that I was, in fact, an atheist and not an agnostic. It was kind of a pivotal conversation in my life, though I'm sure he doesn't remember it. In his book, he gives reason to believe that there was an actual flood of the cities of Shuripak and Kish in the surrounding area that all these tales were based on around 2900 BCE. It was a flood with a likely depth of about 15 cubits, just like the Bible said, because it, at that depth, that whole area would be entirely obscured except for the treetops, which is the way they were described. Aziah Sudra would have already had a large barge to use for transporting his livestock to market. In the technology of the time, it would have been made out of reeds and sealed with pitch, just like the Bible says, not made out of giant planed boards riveted together with steel brackets. Instead, this was a lightweight vessel that could be punted down the river, but in a torrential flood, it would have been washed out into the Persian Gulf and would have made for a harrowing story. But the most important difference between all these is that the older versions of this story are polytheist, dedicated to a pantheon of Mesopotamian deities many centuries before the Canaanite god Yahweh rose to prominence in the developing religion of Judaism. I've met people who think that the Bible is the oldest and first book ever written and that Christianity is somehow the world's original religion. I don't know how these people don't understand that the Jews did not worship Jesus. There are scholars who say that Islam is largely inspired by Christianity, which obviously emerged from Rabbinic Judaism, but the scholarly opinion is that Judaism was itself inspired by Zoroastrianism and that Christianity took different cues from that religion too. Hinduism is the oldest religion in continuous practice, and there are many other deities and religions in archaeology older than any mention of Abraham or his God. The oldest part of the Bible isn't Genesis. It's the book of Job. And that's not as old as believers think it is either. The scholarly opinion is that it was written in the 6th century BCE. Genesis is evidently an adaptation of a collection of Mesopotamian myths brought out by the priestly writers of Babylon around 450 BCE. But now we have fragments of these original stories that are thousands of years older than Genesis. One other myth that we need to talk about is the Tower of Babel. I know it seems unrelated, but even as absurdly silly as this story is, there's actually a kernel of truth to it, which makes all of this easier to understand. Babel is real. It's an abbreviation of Babylon. The tower is real too. Construction was begun by Hammurabi around 1750 BCE, but the project was never completed. Nebuchadnezzar resumed construction some 1200 years later, but he couldn't finish it either. Now we know it as the Marduk Ziggurat because it was originally dedicated to the patron deity of the city of Babylon. Remember that the Mesopotamians invented the first syllabic text, and by Hammurabi's time they had formal classrooms teaching students how to read and write in cuneiform. That's how these ancient stories have survived intact for so long. But with the fall of the Mesopotamian Empire, the money was gone and the lifestyle changed. So construction of the Tower of Babel stopped and the schools closed. Just a couple generations later and no one could read cuneiform anymore. This is the only truth to the fable of the Tower of Babel, that no one could understand written language anymore. 
Thus, the old stories were kept alive by regularly repeating an oral tradition for more than a thousand years before some of these stories were eventually written down again by the Phoenicians. By that time, because these stories were no longer carved in stone, they had evolved, with many of them being blended together and adapted into the developing religion of Judaism, with exaggerations, enhancements, and embellishments irresistibly creeping in over so many generations, despite all intent to stay true. That's why the current version of Noah's Ark reads as it does. That's how we know that it is just a story, and that's just one more of many ways that we know that it isn't true.